This is one of the imaginary gadgets of Leonardo da Vinci, a guy who did a great deal of technical and scientific speculation at his time, but not as we know it. I mean, this is a da Vinci model, which is actually a modern model, because da Vinci did not make models of his own devices. What da Vinci did was perspective drawings of devices. Because he had discovered 3D perspective, and he really thought of this as a kind of ultimate solution to mechanics. And he believed that if he could draw it, it would work, because <laughs> physics had not really been discovered yet. So he figured that you know if he just had sort of the virtual 3D framing of an object, and he corrected, and he connected the objects, if, if it connected the elements of the mechanics in a graphic way, they were bound to work. And people believed him. Because you know, the, 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 uh, the habit of, of objectively testing objects had not really come up. So he filled notebook after notebook after notebook of devices like this, which are very conceptually elegant and look really convincing and have no function. I mean, if you build a device like this, it will not dig beautiful canals. It just, the physics don't work. It's way too frail, and you know, it kind of looks good on paper, and it even sort of looks good as a model. So here's a kind of feat of the imagination, which has no practical application, but is nevertheless well over 500 years old, and it's something that we respect very much and think very highly of. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci, universal genius, father of this and that, precursor, super far-sighted guy, kind of mechanical prophet, <coughs> who kind of overlooked the fact that most of his devices do not work. They never worked. It was not possible for them to work. And in fact, he didn't really make any serious effort to build them. And they wouldn't have worked. And in fact, most of his notebooks were secret. He didn't even show people the plans for them to work. The one thing we contribute to this debate, or whatever it is, this, this atemporal device, is that we build modern models of them. This is a modern model built for the tourist trade. It was like made by us for us. Da Vinci didn't make this thing. It's like, you know, the, the economic for reason for this to exist is that people can come in and admire its prescience. They don't work. They're not going to work. They're never, ever going to work. You can't improve them. You can't make They're just kind of in a space which is kind of not futuristic and not archaic, sort of modern because we made them for our purposes and also archaic at the same time and detached, right? It broke loose. It broke loose. Okay, now this is a real object. This is a Babylonian message. Uh, it's actually from a Babylonian governor to an Egyptian pharaoh. Uh, so it was a very practical piece of dead media, you know, and I, I have a very intense interest in, in media history, so of course I was attracted by this. Now what interests me about this, instead of what gives it its atemporality, is that there was a time when this was superbly practical. I mean, it was a simple, immediate, everyday kind of communication. And then there was a period of about 3,000 years when absolutely nobody knew what this said. It, you know, its use function was just plain gone because nobody could translate cuneiform. And there were tons of cuneiform objects lying around, but they had no communicative function. They were just marked bricks. We couldn't really engage with them. They were not history to us. We couldn't read them, and they conveyed nothing to us. And then, uh, over about the past 150 years, we began to sort of chip away at cuneiform, and now we can read it quite easily. And now we know precisely what this says. It's basically a tweet. <laughs> it's got a header on top as to where it came from, and it's got an address on the bottom as to who it's going to. And then there's about 140 characters in the middle that say, Thanks for the message, I'll do just as you tell me. And that's what this is. 
So here we have an object which is very old and was sort of in a space where it was indecipherable and is now sort of recyclable. So, you know, it's kind of like popped in and out in, in, in our kind of social relationship to it. I mean, for a while it was communication, and then for a very, very long time it was just a weird Lovecraftian, inexplicable curio from a dead civilization, and now it's once again banal. I mean, we just sort of know what it says, and it doesn't say anything particularly important, except, you know, message received, I'll do as you say. Right? So like the social function of that, the object itself hasn't changed at all. I mean, it's just baked clay. I mean, the thing's basically indestructible, unless you hit it with a hammer. It's more like its place in history is like vanished violently in and out over a long <coughs> period. That's why it's atemporal. Right? I mean, it's not futuristic, and it's not even archaic. What it's doing is sort of like varying its social role over a particularly long period. Okay, here we have a rather blurry photograph of a, uh, of a noted French satirist. This guy was a, um, he was a compatriot, a, a contemporary of Jules Verne, and he was a cartoonist. Uh, oh gosh, I've forgotten his name now. Pity. Uh, oh, Albert Robida. That's his signature there in the corner. A R R O, -R -O B I D A. Albert Robida. So Albert Robida was in many ways more foresightful than Jules Verne, mostly because he was a satirist. This is a test tube baby. It's a test tube baby from about 1880. So what you're looking at here is a satirical forecast of the remote past that is about an event that was very shocking and science fictional to us about 30 years ago. And now there are tens of thousands of test tube babies among us, and one of you may be a test tube baby and nobody would think twice about it. And they're like, oh, I can't possibly, there are test tube babies who have their own children. In fact, the entire term test tube baby is kind of fallen out of use. The idea of being a test tube baby is rather archaic. So we're kind of like used to it. But there weren't many people at the time who had the foresight to realize that test tube babies would exist or that they would be associated with, with what's clearly a mad scientist figure here, this kind of disheveled, semi-bohemian science genius chemist who's you know, stirring the baby in a pot with a cane. Now, and why does this work? Well, you know, it works particularly well because it's meant to elicit shocked laughter. It's like, baby out of a tube? Ha, 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 ha. Well, I can't, you know, okay. It's the very extremity of it that gives it the foresight, right? So my question is, or, or really my assertion is that this, is, this image is in a different kind of space now than it used to be. It's not futuristic. It's not archaic. It's not an old-fashioned image. It's not a new-fashioned image. It's an atemporal image. It's saying something to us which kind of varies widely over a long period, but it's not really an image of the 1880s. It's not an image of the 1980s when this particular prediction came true. It's actually sort of broken loose from our normal mechanisms of temporal interpretation, and it's just kind of in a space, right? And to look at it now does something to us that it would not have done in 1880 or 1980. I mean, we have like, I mean, we react to the image, it's funny, it's well drawn, it's a nice piece of graphic design, you know, it, it's a fairly easy image to read, but it's a very difficult image to place. Okay, this is not exactly what I...